its story. At one time, the largest boat company in the world. Over 1,200 employees with 623,000 square feet. It was the largest boat plant under one roof in the world. Peak production of over 22,000 boats and $36 million in sales. This is the story how Glastron reached that level and the people who made it happen. It all began in the spring of 1956. Bob Hammond was head of the fiberglass division of Lone Star Boat Company in Grand Prairie, one of the largest manufacturers of aluminum boats. While there, he began designing the new fiberglass models, including one he intended to build at home for himself, a radical 15-footer called the Meteor. Bill Gaston was a dealer in Austin for Glassport fiberglass boats, the industry leader at the time, and found that he could sell more than he could purchase. Bob Shoup was the owner of Capital Casket Company in Austin and was interested in a source of a fiberglass casket shells for his manufacturing operation. Guy Woodard of Fort Worth sold adhesive products to both Hammond and Shoup and arranged a meeting at Hammond's home in Arlington to explore their mutual interest. It resulted in Hammond's building a prototype 15-foot runabout for evaluation. The test was successful, and a corporation called Standard Glass Products was formed with a total capitalization of 25,000 raised from small groups of investors. Betty Hammond came up with the Glastron name, and on October the 12th, Hammond loaded up some molds and some used tools in a $300 pickup and left for Austin, which had been decided on for the new plant. Shoup had rented a 4,000 square foot building on Willow Springs Road, and production was begun on two models, the 15 foot Fireflight and Surflight, basically the same deck and hull with two interiors. After a successful testing of the production model at Galveston, Gaston left on a sales trip with the boat on a trailer behind his pickup, calling on dealers. 25 boats were produced by Christmas, and the company almost broke even. In 1957, for the 1958 model year, the 17-foot Seaflight was offered with textured mylar on the sides to distinguish it from the products of companies that were beginning to imitate Glastron. A 14-foot Ski Flight was also offered, and 900 boats were produced. Within a year, the company outgrew their original facility, as well as an 11,000-square-foot rented addition. In 1958, they moved to a 33,000-square-foot sheet metal building on Justin Lane. Here, they installed one of the industry's first overhead monorail mold system, as well as fixed assembly line tracks. Sales multiplied 400% to 3,878 boats and over $2 million. With the 1959 model came the first of many innovations, such as intricately molded dashboards, custom-designed step pads, built-in splash wells, embossed vinyl seat inserts, and aluminum frame wraparound windshields. The company emphasized its Galveston structural testing in its brochure, a practice that was unheard of at the time. Distributors had been signed up across the country, and a second plant at Madison, Indiana was set up to reduce freight costs. Glastron's business was booming, and they felt the need to move into the air for transportation. A small twin-engine plane was co-purchased to call on the distributors and two plants. Dad Colley, a former military and airline pilot, came aboard as sales promotion manager along with his piloting skills. In 1959, Glastron bought eight acres in northwest Austin and built a small warehouse as the first of its permanent facilities and acquired a majority interest in Multiglass, a local company producing a 17-foot and 26-foot cruiser. Ground was soon broken for a new 32,000 square foot plant on Reed Drive and Glastron went public with the $600,000 stock and debenture sale sold through a New York investment firm. Operations were consolidated in Austin and the Madison plant was closed. 
In 1961, Bill Gaston came aboard full-time as executive vice president. Glastron was one of the first to offer stern drives, and sales began to rebound from the 1961 recession. The company had an open house and brought back the original prototype for the event. During a trip to Florida, Hammond had an opportunity to evaluate a new deep V hull design that had won an extremely rough Miami Nassau race and was so impressed with the smoothness of the ride, the company started immediate development of the V-194 powered with a Volvo stern drive. Two boats were built with twin factory tuned engines provided by Volvo and the boats were entered in the prestigious 235 mile around Long Island Marathon. Jim Wynn, inventor of the Volvo stern drive and Tom Bottomsley, editor of the boating magazine, drove one and Hammond and Jim Black, a Volvo representative, the other to set first and second fastest time. The event brought national attention at modest cost and racing became an important marketing tool for the company. In the early years, almost any of Glastron's friends that had a tuxedo, good looking wife, and also liked to party were drafted as models for the company's brochure. Despite this, several became prominent community leaders. In 1962, many plant improvements were made, such as a centralized resin and gel coat system, with overhead piping to locations throughout the plant to ensure maximum quality control and efficiency. Glastron sales increased 40% to over $3 million and profits of $224,000. The increased sales made it mandatory for the plant to continue to expand in size. Glastron's racing program continued to pay off with a record-setting first place Hudson River Marathon. Plant manager Ray Atwood, first overall, and Rick Stein's first single outboard in a V-163 in the Around Long Island Marathon. Jim Klinkenbeard, Salt and Sea 500 first place win in a V-171, capped it off. Glastron's stock hull performance was drawing national attention by beating custom designed race boats. In January of 1964, the company introduced the 23-foot V-234, based on the aqua lift hull, and expanded the line to 15 models. The $5 million sales mark was broken for the first time with earnings of $249,000. Glastron's growth had begun to attract potential investors and in September 1964, 50% of the stock was sold to Hugh Howe of San Antonio through his Blanco Oil Company. This money, along with a $500,000 line of credit negotiated with Chase Manhattan Bank, allowed for an additional working capital and a buyback of the debentures sold during the original stock sale. The company now had approximately 400 employees and was winning annual Chamber of Commerce awards as the fastest growing company in the small non-industrial college town. An open house was held for the first time. This plan shows the main building with three molding lines at the left end. Boats were then sent to the center for sanding, deck hardware, and final joining and fitting on the multiple assembly lines before leaving the building for storage in the adjacent warehouses to the right one of which was the original warehouse. In September, the distributors boarded this charter constellation for a sales trip to Mexico City and Acapulco, the first of 10 to come in this history. In a promotional race from New Orleans to Chicago, Glastron and Johnson Motors finished in front of thousands of dealers during the national trade show. 
In January 1966, Hammond attended the London Boat Show, where his dealer had Glastron's first international exhibit, and met Norman Fletcher, who later built Glastron in England. After a visit to Barcelona, an agreement was signed with Earhart Keller for La Raya to manufacture Glastrons in Spain. Later that year, Glastron introduced the V-176 Swinger, a milestone boat using the aqua lift hull with two sponsons for extra stability. Galveston testing against competitive boats showed it to be so superior that a crash program was set up to finish tooling and produce 100 boats for a mass marketing introduction. Chet Strickland with the Mercury factory team drove a triple Mercury-powered V-201 to first outboard in the tough Miami-Nassau powerboat race, and the V-171 continued to dominate California racing. The distributor council again picked Acapulco for the annual sales trip and a dealer program increased the number to 400 with three chartered Braniff jets. 1966 was Glastron's last as an independent public company. Half had acquired control of a company called Conroy through a merger with Blanco Oil. Glastron and Conroy directors felt it would be in the best interest of shareholders to combine Conroy's American exchange listing with Glastron's earnings. The Glastron Fat Boat. Range 3500. Get the Fat Charge launcher. Roger. Glastron was commissioned by 20th Century Fox to design and build the Bat Boat. Mel Whitley visited the studio with sketches, and approval was given, and development started in the secret Glastron Fat Works. The boat was complete with all the bat weapons to combat evil foes. The V-174 shown here is the same hull that was used as an outboard and inboard and was one of the company's most successful hulls. It probably won more races than any other production boat in its time. The world premiere of Batman was held in Austin, where it was a huge success. In a more serious vein, Conroy's plan was to become a diversified holding company. It purchased Nautilon of Nashville, Tennessee, which was selling all of the boats they could produce, and appointed Jack Purcell, then sales manager, as president. A municipal bond issue was arranged in nearby Hendersonville, and Glastron engineers designed a new 140,000 square foot state-of-the-art plant. Nautiline operated as a division of Glastron for several years. The V-156 Sportster was the world's best-selling outboard. Over 5,700 were produced in the peak year of 1973. Although there were many copies, no one ever successfully matched Glastron's combination of quality, features, and price. During this time, deck boats and other innovative boats, including sailboats, were produced by Glastron. That year, the first Berkeley jet pumps were sold in the V-174, primarily for the West Coast market. Glastron also developed a 22-foot motorhome, and Larry Hufford, one of Glastron's first production managers, was hired as president to set up the motorhome production in East Austin. Glastron's 1967 sales reached almost $10 million with after-tax earnings of 594,000. And in March of 1968, another major plant addition was finished to meet growing demand. In October 1968, Glastron signed a license agreement with Angelo Molinari in Como, Italy to build their wooden tunnel hull race boat. 
Molinari was considered the premier race boat in Europe, and the first boat shown here won the Paris six-hour race a week later. Concurrently, management had determined there was a limited market for an upscale line of runabouts, and had negotiated the purchase of Carlson boats of Garden Grove, California. Production of the Molinari race boats was turned over to them while Glassbron designed new models for the Carlson line. Art Carlson won many of the Boat of the Year awards given by Power Boat Magazine. Glastron's real success was in attracting and keeping key management people, such as Ernest Smith and Lauren Hudgens in sales. Operations Vice President Jerry DeCamp and key members of his staff like Ray Botello, Jerry Wilhoit, and George Hodges. Bob Hammond was first appointed to the Boating Industry Association Boat Engineering Committee in 1960 and served as chairman from 1965 to 1968. He was also a director of the American Boat and Yacht Council and the first BIA director to be appointed to the board of the National Association of Engine and Boat Manufacturers, where he served as executive vice president until 1975. In January 1968, Conroy acquired Snowjet Snowmobiles of Thetford Mines, Quebec, which was believed to be the third largest manufacturer at the time. Glastron management became active in certain areas where their skills could contribute, such as accounting, styling, and promotion. Hammond served as chairman for several years. In its peak years, Snowjet built over 30,000 units. In 1969, Glastron finalized a contract with Volvo Penta of Sweden to private label their stern drive package. The program was so successful, an automotive engineer, Jim Benson, was hired to develop a V8 marinizing program for the stern drives and Berkeley water jet. The engines were built to Glastron specifications by Ford and shipped in boxcars to Austin for assembly and dynamometer testing. The total package concept and price advantage caught the industry by surprise, dramatically increasing stern drive sales. The unique transom stacking system was improved to handle boats up to 23 feet long, and in September, over 500 dealers boarded four jets for Puerto Rico. In 1970, Glastron signed an agreement with a large chemical company in Zagreb, Yugoslavia to design a new boat plan and license production for eastern countries. Jerry DeCamp and Dick Scheib were instrumental in the negotiation. Word was getting around, and everyone who was anyone was beginning to want a Glastron, even Queen Elizabeth and the royal family. Glastron's Molinari program got started with the first fiberglass twin engine going into production, and team manager Harold Workerson and driver Joe Fielder started collecting trophies. John Gill had been in partnership with Jim Wynn in marine design consulting and came to Glastron to oversee the increasingly complex engineering and BIA certification and safety standards. Even top management got in the act. The 60 mile per hour CV-21 Carlson with the Berkeley jet was launched with Ernie Schmidt driving it before his hair turned gray. The CV-19 and 21 are shown here with some of those same unpaid actors with tuxedos, a little older and a little more faded, just like this photo. In September, over 500 dealers and distributors boarded chartered planes for Spain and North Africa. A major factor in Glastron's growth was the establishment of financial controls led by Jack Katzenmeyer in accounting and Alex Hodge in data processing for manufacturing control.
Flashtron's unit volume had reached the point where the company could introduce many custom innovative features, such as these shown here at no extra cost to the customer. Many of these features were adopted by the industry and created extra value for all consumers. Glastron grew to become recognized as a world-class company. Operating through Bert Cortez and his autocrat equipment company near New Orleans, ultimately boats were shipped to over 50 foreign countries, and licensees were signed in Spain, Britain, Venezuela, Trinidad, New Zealand, Australia, Yugoslavia, and South Africa. The largest being Earhart Keller's La Raya in Barcelona and Norman Fletcher in Birmingham, England. The most important European markets were served by Ramon Guillard in northern France and Ari de Blum in the Netherlands and southern France, Bruno Tibas in Germany, and Keller in Spain where he captured 50% of the market. <music> 1971 concluded the Glastron factory team racing effort with a flourish. Management and financial demands were becoming excessive, and the company went into the year deciding it would be their last to participate. Team manager Harold Wilkerson was given the budget to pick the top outboard races in the country, and Reggie Fountain, an insurance executive from North Carolina, was chosen to drive the brand new twin engine Glastron Molinari. The 100 mile per hour boat won five races in a row competing against the Mercury and OMC factory teams and drivers. At the World Championships, Fountain finished second close behind the Mercury factory team Molinari. He won $10,000 and was named Driver of the Year. After the award ceremony, Glastron sold him the boat and equipment, and he went on to set three world records in the same boat, winning 15 of 16 races, and eventually becoming a three-time world champion. The publicity, recognition, and engineering prestige Glastron achieved with his racing program could never have been purchased. Other drivers such as Johnny Sanders, Kenny Calabat, Jim Black, Charlie Scrugg, John Culver, Cliff Reed, Bob Hammond, Dick Shearer, Daryl Jenkins, Jim McElwain, and Ronaldo Molinari and drivers in other countries set more records and won more races than any other production boat company in the world. In September, 550 dealers and distributors flew to Caracas for a week at the Matuco Sheraton. Bill Gaston was a leader in industry affairs, serving as Governmental Relations Committee Chairman for BIA, ABYC Vice Chairman, two three-year terms as a member of the Coast Guard Advisory Council, and was awarded the Michelob Schooner Award by August Bush as outgoing chairman of the Boating Industry Association. Ernie Schmidt also served as BIA Boat Show Chairman. Glastron's innovative storage and loading system, coupled with the warehousing capability of it and its distributors, allowed the factory to run efficiently year-round. Seventeen inspectors, such as Willie Dusick, shown here along with Million Miles Safe Driver Les Godfrey, delivered the first-class boats to the dealer organization. The 1972 line was increased to 25 models. The expansion was deemed necessary by management's belief in staying responsive to changing market demands and identifying developing trends. This attribute is considered a requisite to the growth of any company. Glastron was always willing to experiment. While not every idea was successful, many were copied and became industry standards over the years. Some not shown here were the early adoption of mechanical steering and full foam flotation of all its boats, features that were written into the 1971 Safe Boating Act. The V-156 Sportster mentioned earlier was the most successful in Glastron's history, 
and held the industry sales record for any boat of its size for many years to come. One came off of one of three custom assembly lines every 17 minutes. 20,000 were built from 1972 to 1975 alone. While copied by many others, no one can match the combination of quality, durability, and price Glastron was able to achieve. To identify and develop the products for an ever-changing market, more than 65 people were involved in engineering, product development, and tooling. Jack Beale, a retired Air Force Colonel and professional engineering project manager, was hired to supervise the growing engineering staff. Mel Whitley headed styling and product development. While Hammond had designed all the boats in the early years, he and Mel collaborated as Hammond's duties forced him to travel more. But every year they would disappear into their skunk works for a couple of weeks, usually Acapulco, to come up with working designs for next year's model. Glastron continued the practice it had begun in 1956 of testing each new model in the Gulf of Mexico for 40 hours. As seen in this picture, not all of them made it. Engineering test boats and old modes were bulldozed to prevent their use by others. In the fall of 1972, ground was broken for a 52,000 square foot cruiser plant and a 165,000 square foot combination raw materials warehouse and parts manufacturing building to be completed in 1973. Sales increased 38% to over $27 million and earnings of $1,585,000. In September, over 700 dealers took charter jets to Rome. Glastron sold the producers of the James Bond movie, Live and Let Die, 26 boats, and helped them find someone to make this record 110-foot jump that resulted in the most widely publicized boating photograph ever taken. Kit Parsons and Bill Lacey, Glastron's outside advertising partner, dreamed up the extraordinary boat for the Extraordinary Man campaign and hired an unemployed would-be actor named Joe Cool, who preferred to remain anonymous due to the pay scale, but agreed to the job due to the perk of working with beautiful models. It's rumored Joe accused the pair of dreaming up some of the stunts over martinis. The ads, along with Carlson's excellent workmanship, led to his move to a new 75,000 square foot plant in Anaheim. In 1973, the new cruiser plant opened under the direction of Fernando Maldonado, a longtime employee. The newly developed B-256 flybridge, along with other large boats, were moved to this building, but not even it escaped Galveston testing. In the spring, Glastron moved into its new south building, and the plant now totaled 581,000 square feet, the largest anywhere. Sales exceeded 36 million, with earnings of 1,694,000, and production of 22,154 boats. Five Eastern jets brought 800 people to the plant for a tour before reboarding for Acapulco, but one DC-8 with 200 aboard was too big for the Austin airport and went direct. By early 1974, the oil embargo had created sales and manufacturing problems domestically, but multilingual international marketing Mark Belial and Bert Cortez continued to increase export sales dramatically. At boat shows all over the world, management's years of travel and work was paying off. To help early spring domestic sales, meetings were arranged with European distributors, and they were encouraged to take more of the stern drive boats, the inventory of which had been built up over the winter. While the European retail shows, such as London, Paris, Genoa, Dusseldorf, and Barcelona, 
were as big as those in the United States. European manufacturers were yet to see the necessity of trade shows. At the encouragement of NAEBM's Pete Wilson while serving as president of the International Boat Show Organizers, an October show was eventually held in Hamburg, where Glastron and its European distributors worked with Germany's Bruno Tebas to attract and sign dealers from all over Europe. Many celebrities, including President Johnson, who had two, continued to buy glass rods. But a V204 sold by Florida distributor Dave Craig for Aristotle Onassis Christina, the world's largest private yacht, was a well-kept secret. While international travel in those days was always interesting, it had its moments of excitement, as evidenced by these tragic photos taken by a glass rod executive. Glastron pioneered dealer incentive trips and through a cost-sharing arrangement with this distributor organization was the only company that could afford to take such large dealer groups overseas. The company was always heavily involved in promotion both at the dealer and consumer level. It had a standing order for the monthly coveted inside front page of Boating Industry Magazine for over 10 years and kept the Glastron name in front of the trade continuously. Some of these ads, also run in Boat and Motor Dealer Magazine, were geared towards the fun and excitement of being a Glastron dealer, while others got down to the hard financial incentives. In 1974, Glastron went to Hawaii, but Glastron's West Coast distributor, Bud Aronis, insisted on making a pre-inspection trip to check on fishing. In 1965, here's the original Hardy Band with a requisite group photo on the island, and Dad making the requisite speech on buying more Glastron. Jack Mowald of ABW got a sales pitch from Gaston. In 1966, the group again went to Acapulco, this time with dealers. Million dollar awards were given with Lawrence Erlison getting the top award. Glastron even arranged an earthquake. In 1967, over 375 boarded two ships for the Bahamas bash. Nautiline provided a 34 foot houseboat for local color. And this shot wound up on the cover of a national boating magazine whose editor just happened to be a guest. A fun time was again had by all and one of Lawrence Hudgens' jokes caused Dusty to reply, you gotta be kidding. Over 500 went back to Acapulco in 1968 for more margaritas, more sun, more fun, fishing, cockfights, and many more bull sessions. But Montezuma got his revenge in the end. In 1969, 700 boarded their company jets for Puerto Rico with cabin service by Ernie Smith and service manager Dickie Kemp. Bill Gaston practiced the Spanish Fandango with publisher Gene Wagaman for the not yet announced 1970 trip to Spain. After landing, it was more of the same old boring party, party, party. Advertising manager Parsons received a prestigious advertising award from the boating press and Perry Pepper smiled his approval. In 1970, Glastron emptied the Chicago trade show the last day when dealers took off in their jets for the Spanish Fandango. They started in Torremolinos, visit Malaga, boarded a ferry for North Africa to be entertained by locals, and returned to Spain for the real Fandango, a private bull ring party La Raya's Earhart Keller had arranged. Everyone had a good time but him. We're not sure. He was gourd or bored. If it's 1971, it must be Caracas. Again, the hard partying crowd revved up their jets for another ordeal at the Martuco Sheraton. 
It had been built by the former dictator, and executives enjoyed the use of his five-room suite, reserved for the exclusive use of heads of state. Licensee Fernando Martorette arranged for it, and with Kit Parsons, a surprise party for the boss, complete with Miss Venezuela, he did not get to keep the girl. In 1972, over 707 brave souls took off for Rome and another week of serious partying. A toga party was held at the Cavalieri Hilton, where Bud Aronis arranged for Jim Harrison to get a short toga, Tom McLoon to get a long one, and Hammond to get the blame and threats from Harrison every March for years to come. Everyone agreed, Helen and Mike McCune were the noblest Romans of all, and the irrepressible Kit Parsons started things off. But not even wild horses could keep the queen of the party from making her grand entrance. Bill and Dusty Gaston maintained the only sense of decorum in evidence by the executive group. A good time was had by nearly all. Some didn't remember anything. Although everyone cleaned up for the big banquet at the Excelsior Hotel, the damage was done, and the Cabaniere told the gang not to return. After a year of uninterrupted rest of just selling boats, 1,009 Glastron aficionados took their jets into Austin for a quick tour of the new plant before heading off to the brand new Acapulco Princess. There they were greeted by margaritas, a pledge from Montezuma to ignore them, and one of Acapulco's incredible fireworks displays. The mariachis played, and all of the gang enjoyed the many festivities offered. Bill Gaston stroked the boating press brass, as did Jerry DeCamp, while Houston's Gary Hill looked inappropriately serious. Bob and Betty enjoyed a laugh. Hugh House told a story to Billy Katzenmeyer, and everyone retreated to the pool to dry out. Completely ignoring advice about Mexican weddings and Acapulco adventures, two couples got married anyway, and 1,000 guests crashed their reception. Jesse White had his usual good time, Frank Crawford was above it all, and Acapulco was never the same. Jerry and Elizabeth DeCamp said it all on the way home. This story started with how big was Glastron? Statistics really don't tell the story. From its beginning in 1956 to the 1,200 dedicated employees, 623,000 square foot plant, sales network of 27 distributors and 1,000 dealers, eight licensees overseas, and distribution in 50 foreign countries, Glastron was really a story of people. It takes people to make a company. A few we have been able to show in this brief synopsis, as well as those we could not, or what set Glastron apart and made it a family. One of the nation's largest dealers said it best. He bought Glastron just to go on the trip because he enjoyed the people. As stated before, when Glastron started, the boat business was a small industry. Boating Industry Magazine could and did host cocktail parties in 1956 for all the exhibitors at the Chicago Boat Show. Glastron distributors played a key role in helping small dealers both financially, with marketing aids, and working at their boat shows. Even sophisticated dealers in large markets became Glastron dealers, perhaps because the company was just too big to ignore. Glastron's management thoroughly enjoyed what they were doing and took pride in the belief that they were the best. Their racing program was a success that will probably never be duplicated by a production boat company. It brought publicity, 
recognition, and engineering prestige to the Glastron name. Glastron's publicity efforts were a sign of management's confidence in its ability and its product. Through exposure in some of the movies, Glastron boats will be seen by future generations in years to come. Bob Hammond, founding president of Glastron Boat Company, resigned after 17 years with the firm. I've been pondering this move for almost two years, said Hammond. The main thing I want to do is run my own show. I want to get out on my own and do something different. Jerry V. DeCamp, operations vice president, also notified Glastron he would resign August 31st to become president of another company. Many there are whose dear and remembered faces we would love to see at this gathering of the Glastron family. But alas, so many have answered that one clear call, who have put out to sea that one last time at the beckoning of the pilot of us all. We know, and they know, that they live on in our memories, and their spirits are with us, as ours are with them, as they have crossed the bar. <laughs>